and we are live on Facebook. Take it away, Rick. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alex. Alex. Uh, welcome, um, everyone, to uh, Birds on the Bay. My name is uh, Rick Mittler, and I'm the Virginia Student Leadership Program Manager here with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and I'll be your MC for today. I also, again, want to give a big shout out to Alice Chrisman. Alice is CBF Senior Manager of Marketing Community Engagement, who will be kind of keeping our ship on track today. We have lots of great information to share with you, so I want to get right to it. Big or small, colorful camouflage, locals to fly by residents, the diversity of the birds in the Chesapeake Bay watershed is incredible. The birds are also amazing indicators of the health of the habitats that make the Bay watershed so unique. Today, we have two amazing Chesapeake Bay Foundation educators to talk with us about birds, where we can find them, and how they can contribute to saving the Bay. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the program, please ask them in the comments section if you're joining us on Facebook, or you can use the Q&A box if you're Zooming in with us today. Uh, we'll have a chance to kind of answer a lot of those questions after we hear from our amazing guest speakers. So let's introduce those experts. First off, we have Bill Portlock. Can you give us a wave, Bill? Uh, Bill is CBF's uh, senior educator. Bill actually started with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation in 1981 and is our resident bird guru. We also have Maya Alexander. Maya? Maya is our Potomac River Environmental Education Program Manager and is our backyard bird aficionado. So let's I'm start with Bill. Bill, will you tell us a little bit more about what you do for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation? Sure. I'm a senior educator and I uh, teach teachers and students uh, about the bay and its ecology. Um, I photo document the bay and the living resources like these uh, two young chick ospreys with their mother. Um, and uh, I work with our staff in environmental studies and in water quality monitoring. Great. Uh, will you tell us a little bit more about why birds are important to the bay? Sure. Uh, because birds have a high metabolism, they are uh, very sensitive to pollution. Uh, and because they're highly visible, um, they make good targets for us to watch and see uh, the sort of an indicator of the health of our environment. Um, birds are found in every habitat in the Bay watershed, air, water, forests, marshes, beaches. Um, and they're, again, good uh, indicators of the health of the environment. Um, they're also early messengers um, for telling us about the uh, about the bay. Um, the eagle, I think the next picture has uh, bald eagle. They, of course, went through a decline, serious decline in the 1970s due to a persistent pesticide called DDT. So uh, sometimes the presence or absence or decline of birds can be good indicators. Um, also, um, birds are important for providing um, ecological services. That's uh, such as pollination with a ruby threaded hummingbird in a lobelia, a cardinal flower. Um, they also are good at seed uh, dispersal, or Carolina wren here. And the flycatchers and swallows are uh, important in con controlling noxious pests, insects, uh, predators that uh, also, uh, raptors that eat small mammals are uh, really helpful in, in keeping our uh, earth and our planet healthy. Um, another uh, role of birds uh, is that of the uh, turkey vultures, which are the scavengers. Um, these beautiful birds really do a great service to us in, in uh, cleaning carcasses up. So uh, this, uh, the last, I guess, would be the economics of birding. Um, it, there's a sizable number of people that are looking for birds these days, and uh, they spend money in communities where birds are uh, sometimes especially numerous. So those are just some of the ways birds benefit the bay. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. What, is, what does the presence of birds mean when we see birds out in our watershed? Well, it, it can, again, be a, a measure of the health of their environment or the habitats um, we have. Um, there are a few studies, though, that really measure the personal benefits that watching a warbler in a treetop, say, or an egret flying overhead. Um, but studies have shown that spending time in nature can be very important for cognitive and mental health. Um, there's an author, uh, Kimberly Kaufman, who uh, wrote, birding is such a gateway to nature. It gets people outside on their, off their computer screens and away from television. And uh, it exposes them to fresh air and to, uh, it just lifts their spirits. And you have to admit, uh, these days we can have a little more joy in all our lives. This yeah. Downy woodpecker. This, uh, these are common birds around feeders in their backyards. 
great. Um, how did you become interested in bird watching, Bill? Well, I had a professor, an ornithology professor in college who shared his passion for birds with me. Um, and I've also been very fortunate to have friends that know more than I do and uh, ornithologists that have spread their wings, uh, so to speak, um, to uh, help me learn how to see. Uh, in particular, uh, this bird, indigo bunting, uh, was one of the early birds that I uh, saw uh, when I was learning to, about birds. I knew herons and eagles and ospreys, but small songbirds I hadn't paid much attention to. And a friend pointed out one, I wasn't so sure what it was and it took me about half an hour to find it. And then uh, sure enough, it was exactly what he had said it was. And I thought there must be something to this. So I've uh, been captivated ever since. So we know that spring is in full bloom throughout most of the watershed, but what are some of like the best seasons for, for watching birds? Oh, all seasons. Um, this tufted titmouse is a resident uh, around my yard, but um, this time of year in spring is the peak of the migration. Spring migration has literally millions of birds that are pouring through North America, coming up from the south and the tropics, and they're going to Canada, many of them, and uh, they spend a few nights and days with us here. Um, in the summer, we have residents that are nesting, and uh, of course, fall is the time for uh, uh, birds as they've grown. Here's a pelican uh, rookery in the, near Smith Island in the Maryland portion of the bay. Um, and wintertime is the time when we get uh, uh, waterfowl, the ducks and swan and, and geese coming in. So really all seasons have something to offer people that want to see birds. So I know we don't have enough time to talk about every single bird in the watershed, but I know there are some key species that are out there. So what are some of those popular birds that we might find throughout the Bay watershed? Well, there's a term called charismatic megafauna, meaning the, the larger birds or, or animals uh, tend to have more human attention and, and uh, watching, but uh, there are uh, certainly eagles have made a big recovery in the Chesapeake Bay. Here's a pair the female is on the left. She's a little larger than the male. Um, and they, uh, of course, went through a huge decline in the 1970s due to the uh, DDT, the pesticide contamination. Um, they're back and, in fact, have grown uh, the population at about 10% uh, percent a year, increasing since uh, for two decades. So just about anywhere in the bay, you can see eagles if you're in the right habitat, meaning you're near water. Um, osprey are another bird that's iconic in the bay. They tolerate humans well. So we do see them often around our uh, front, uh, our waters in the, in the bay. Great blue herons and, and herons in general are uh, also common birds and, and pretty large area birds uh, seen around the bay. Great blue herons are probably the one that is the, uh, the birds most widely dispersed on our rivers and the bay. So what are some birds that kind of have some interesting quirks? Like what are some of those unique birds that we might find in the Bay watershed? Well, this uh, slide is one. These are uh, Wilson snipe. They're a type of shorebird that's found in freshwater tidal wetlands quite often. Uh, they're a common bird, but they're hard to see. They, they blend in very well unless they're flying like here. But their uh, behavior is um, unusual in that the males and females mate, they build a nest, they raise, they have uh, four eggs typically. And as the female lays those eggs, the first two that hatch go off with their father and he raises them. And then the last two eggs are hatched and they get, stay with their mother and the, uh, they don't see each other again. An another interesting bird, I guess, would be the chipping sparrow. Uh, it's a common bird in our yards and uh, have that red cap uh, identifying them and wing bars, but they have a, a unique nest in that they build it, um, lining it with horse hair or with, uh, or in my case here with dog hair. Um, and we've got other birds like cardinals you'll see in your yards perhaps. Um, they mate for life and they sing and duet each other in the mornings. The male will sing part of a song, the female or will follow it up or vice versa. So there's a lot going on in the bird world if you take your time and, and listen and, and watch. 
All right. Thank you so much, uh, Bill, for sharing all that and kind of about what, some of these different birds that we might see throughout the Bay Watershed. But now I kind of want to turn it over to Maya. Again, Maya is our uh, Potomac River Environmental Education Program Manager. Typically, Maya would be aboard the B. Heyman Clark, our, one of our education vessels, leading participants on a hands-on investigation of the Potomac River. Uh, but fortunately for us today, she's here to share with us how we can watch some of our feathered friends. So Maya, I was hoping you can just kind of talk to us about how we could start finding birds, especially kind of during these times of stay at home orders. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, I'm finding that bird watching during these times, I mean, very therapeutic and great for my mental health. I know Bill mentioned it um, earlier, but it's great. And the great thing is that it's easy um, as long as you have access to the outdoors. So maybe you have a porch, a backyard, cool, but even better, a window. You don't have to travel very far to see birds because they live just about anywhere. Great, that's awesome. So I know you've mentioned before that you're you're a new birder, um, new to the bird watching world. But what are some things that have surprised you, or might surprise the audience, that you've learned um, more as you learned about bird watching? Yeah, for me, yeah, I'm by no means an ornithologist. So for <laughs> me, what was surprising, I guess, getting started. Um, with birding is that you don't have to be so focused and caught up in knowing every single bird because there's so much knowledge and so much to know about these birds. Um, but just kind of starting off at your own pace, you really can make the birding experience unique to you. And I think that that's what's important. So for you, you can start off by just noticing the different sizes of birds. That's a big bird, that's a small bird. Mm -hmm. um, and then as you get more comfortable, then you can graduate and say, all right, I'm ready to look at the flying patterns or you know, the different colors of birds. So you take it at your own pace. And I think that's really important to note. Um, something else I'd like to point out is um, birding, where you can find birds is actually pretty cool. A lot of people don't really think um, of all the unique spots you can find them. So I do want to share um, these photos here were actually shared with my neighbors in Baltimore um, in the Federal Hill neighborhood and also Patterson Park where a morning dove was seen and also a cormorant. Um, you see this morning dove has made a nice little nest <laughs> on someone's fence. Um, so I think that's pretty cool, a unique spot. That's great. What are some uh, other unique places that you've, you've seen birds in your bird watching days? Yeah, um, again, still kind of talking about urban settings. I think a lot of people don't really think that you can find a whole bunch of different birds, like the diversity is not very great in urban settings, but there's actually a lot. Again, here's some more birds shared from Baltimore, Cooper's Hawk and Fed Hill and the Great Blue Heron in Patterson Park. It's pretty cool. Um, I like to note that my favorite pair of peregrine falcons, the fastest bird on the planet, can actually be found in Baltimore down in the Inner Harbor. <laughs> um, they have little cute babies, so I definitely encourage you to check out their live stream. Oh, that's great. Um, so what could you recommend some resources maybe for folks who are, are new to the birding world or are looking to get into bird watching? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of tying back to how you can make the birding experience unique to you. Um, there's so many different resources out there, but whatever helps you, you know, enhance your experience, that's what matters. Um, of course, there's the basics like your eyes and your ears to look and see different birds. But if you want, you can also upgrade to these fancy things, binoculars. Um, you can find them basically anywhere. You can use binoculars, telescopes. If you don't have any, you can also make some. Um, I'd like to shout out one of our fellow educators, Tiffany Granberg, who had a cool video on our Facebook page where she actually made um, binoculars and a telescope out of toilet paper rolls. Um, so I encourage you to do that. Um, but there's also other things like bird guides, the Merlin app, which you can get on your phone is another way to be connected. And I'd like to point out having a companion, a mentor is also really helpful when learning all about different birds. That's great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Bill and Maya, for kind of sharing with us a little bit more about birds and how they contribute to saving the bay. I do want to turn it over to um, Alice, I think, for some uh, answers to some of those questions that we had coming in. We do have some questions, some curious, some curious folks out there. My first question is from Jennifer Ralston in Northern Virginia. She has a question, a really actually a good question, a question about bird seed. Like, Bill, where is the best place for us to get bird seed? Like, how would you, I mean, can I just go to the grocery store and get bird seed? Or what would you recommend? Well, yes, you can. Uh, it's found in, in garden centers and grocery stores. Um, there's several kinds. Um, I particularly like black oil sunflower seeds. They tend to attract a, lot of, a good variety of birds. Um, and there's another type of uh, food you can put out. is It's a suet bar uh, or cake. It's um, 
can be hung in a cage wire mesh basket in uh in your yard and that will attract woodpeckers and, and other uh songbirds as well so let me ask you this question do you happen to i know you're in your backyard in virginia because we're all social distancing right now do you happen to have one of the, these, these bars that you're talking about hanging anywhere near you in your backyard that you could possibly show us right now? Uh, sure. Uh, it's oh, that would be great. Not too so far from Bill's backyard in Virginia, as you can see. Mm -hmm. And for a fun fact, I know that the picture on the home slide was a bird that was in his backyard this morning. Oh my goodness, so many. That's, can you see that? Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. it, it, that's cool. So I could just hang that from my, like, that's actually, that looks like a little bit messy, less mess than like the bird seed too. But yeah, if you're, um, if you're, in, if you're into gardening, you shouldn't be too worried about it. Uh, that's right yep. being messy <laughs> okay we're gonna keep going with questions um from eric on facebook he has a question about rails um he has asked how are the rails doing on the bay i don't know that's a good question um it there are several kinds uh, there's a clapper rails king rails virginia rails um and black and uh, rail and yellow rail the black rail is one of the rarest birds in North America. And in, for, unfortunately, it's declining because of the sea level rise associated with global climate change. Um, the marshes are simply being immersed in seawater and, and not suitable for reproduction for black rails. Uh, other rails seem to be holding their own, um, but it's, it's a hard question because um, they're so secretive. Um, you really have to use special techniques, usually sound recordings, uh, and they're nocturnal, so you're out in a marsh in the dark, just listening for ra uh, rails to call. But uh, they're, um, I think, um, they're worth studying because they are again sensitive to habitat change, and that's one of the key spots we're seeing habitat change now. There are our marshes. So that's a good question because that's a link to habitat change, climate change, and then species. Yes. Okay, from Cassie. And maybe this be, it can be a question, we'll open up to everybody. Uh, do you have a favorite bird book, favorite book for birding? Ooh, that's a good question. But yeah. no, I actually, I don't. <laughs> not, not yet, Maya. I know you're, yes, just, you're, yes. you're just getting going. Bill, your favorite bird, bird book. Well, the classic is Roger Torrey Peterson, uh, who really invented the art of looking at birds with certain field marks uh, prior to the 1940s, um, people would have to shoot and kill a bird to identify it often. But uh, today, Sibley is one of the, the better field guides, um, I think, for uh, looking at birds. And there's a new Peterson guide out as well. And there's several others, National Geographic. Uh, Ken Kaufman has a, has a good field guide as well. Okay, great. From Ryan O'Meara, uh, what is the importance of dead standing trees for bird nesting habitat? Dead standing trees for bird nesting habitat. I think we see a lot of bald eagles. Mike, want me to try? Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, my my answer would be, you know, it of course provides, you know, they have that material there depending on the species of mm -hmm. bird. They can use the material from yeah. that tree. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, it also can provide a habitat in itself. So correct me if I'm wrong, though, Bill. Sure. Oh, dozens of birds use are called cavity nesters. Um, woodpeckers will go into often dead trees, build their holes, cavities, raise their young, and then move on. But those cavities remain, and they're used by many other birds, like bluebirds, chickadees, titmice, and others to uh, be their homes in future years. Unless the tree is going to fall in your house, I would say leave the dead tree up. It'll become a condominium for a lot of animals. <laughs> Real estate. If only we could charge yeah. them, right? Yeah. Uh, but they, they, they earn All their, the they, can, they can pay their rent by singing. That's fine by me. Um, <laughs> Tiana has asked from Facebook, how far north have the brown pel pelicans come? How far north do they, have they come? Good. Uh, that's a really good question. You want me to tackle that one too? Sure, go for um, it. They, they were, brown pelicans were not found north of North Carolina until the 1970s. And mm. at that point, they moved up to Virginia and started to nest on uh, Fisherman's Island. Then they've expanded northward. And there's a colony on Smith Island in Maryland, Shanks Island. It's just south of Smith. But um, they 
do go farther north in the in the uh, late summer after the pelicans have finished reproducing. Um, they call it post-breeding dispersal, and other birds do it as well. They move north, then when it gets cold, they turn around and go back south. But the nesting is uh, has been moving northward, and right now I believe Maryland is as far north as brown pelicans will nest. All right, and then from Sarah Kirby, she is asking: Do birds return to the same nesting spots year over year? I noticed great blue herons in my area continue to build nests above a quarry each year. I see blue herons here all the time. I, I like they're my birds. I don't know if I like because I see them all the time. So that's a good question. Yeah, I'll let whoever wants to address that one. Maybe we can start with Bill and see if other folks have seen stuff. Because I know, Rick, you've been out in the field a long time, so you may have seen some, some birds out there too. So the question was, do birds return to their same mm -hmm. nest spot? Well, they do. Um, great blue herons are colonial nesters. They, they nest close by with other herons, usually of the same kind, but great egrets will colonize with them. Um, and the great blue heron rookery, they call them, um, start with a few bird nests. And then as they, if they're successful, other birds are attracted to the site and they can grow to be as many as maybe 50 or 75 nests. Um, and I think they return to the site, but their nests are pretty flimsy and they don't usually last through the winter mm -hmm. storm. So they rebuild uh, each year. But birds like uh, eagles and, and osprey also return to their nests and rebuild, usually just building on. Uh, so an eagle nest um, can, I think one record was uh, 12 feet in uh, depth and about eight feet in diameter, weighed a couple of tons in Florida. But the uh, the birds will renest, uh, and often if it's a good site, that's uh, unattractive for them to come back to it. Yeah. That's a good yeah, there's a, a small tributary off the James River that I've been, been able to frequent with a few students via a uh, canoe. I mean, we often get to see around this time of the year, actually, the prothonotary warbler, which is a mm -hmm. really unique bird. It's really awesome. Uh, the VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University, is doing a big study on them. And these birds are migratory birds, and they'll travel down to Central Central America, like all the way down to Costa Rica and hang out in the mangrove forest. And they have recorded, they've banded these birds and they'll come back and they have found that they'll go back to the exact box that they were, that they were hatched in um, mm -hmm. to lay the, the next set of young. So it's really amazing that this small bird about this big um, kind of looks like the color of, of mustard um, or, uh, or if they're the males or the uh, golden's mustard if they're the females. Um, and then um, we'll travel back to that box. It's really unique that they'll come That's back cool. to that unique location. So I can like get a bird that matches my decor to come back to the same nest every year. <laughs> I, I hope, yeah, there you go. <laughs> that would be so amazing. Rick is the first year. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So um, Carrie Snavely uh, has asked um, for any tips for photography. And again, I'm going to start with Bill, and then we can see, go through the crowd, because I know Rick has been with us for a long time, too, and taken lots of pictures. So, yeah. Yep. Um, well, like the pictures you saw earlier of mine, um, I think patience is probably the virtue of photography and with birding. Um, I would say too, you know, if you can find a bird and see its behavior, you don't want to interrupt their own behavior because they have an energy budget. You don't want to intrude and have them defending it over your presence versus them going about their life. But if you can uh, inconspicuously approach the site and watch what they are doing. Sometimes you can aim, you see where their perch is, they'll go off to, to forage and come back to the same perch. So you might aim a camera at that perch and if you're quiet, they'll come to, back to it. Mm -hmm. Of course, you probably need a longer lens than a, than a wide angle. You, something, usually a, a telephoto is a helpful tool for photographing birds. All right, good to know. And we have one more question that will close off our question. We've talked a lot about being able to see birds and um, where, where can we find some fancy, fancy to non-fancy binoculars these days? Ooh, I mean, a lot of sporting, you can find them like at REI. I mean, I'm sure Dix has them too, but I mean, given the state that we're in right now, online, just Googling um, where you can find some, I'm sure Amazon has got um, some fancy um, binoculars there. Um, Great, awesome. I, that is gonna wrap us wrap us up for the Q&A today, Rick. Let me take it from here. 
All right. Thanks so much, Allison. Thanks again uh, for Bill and Maya. And thanks for those amazing questions coming in. Um, so I do want to uh, highlight a few things that we're doing here at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I really want to point out our Walk the Watershed campaign. Um, so this campaign runs from March 7th through June 30th. So we're at prime time for this. Um, I encourage you to check out the website and either start a team or join your own team. And we're all going to kind of work together to walk that combined 200 miles of the approximate length of the bay. Um, and not only that helps us get outside and then and in kind of like folks were mentioning earlier, kind of it's so important to get outside these days, but it also helps raise those important funds that we need to help save the bay. Also, we have our Learn Outside, a Learn at Home resource page. So this has tons of great videos and activities that are made by amazing educators like Bill um, and Maya, as well as our communication staff um, that you and your family can use to keep learning about the Bay at home. We have nature journaling, ask an expert, amazing things so you can keep learning. And again, it's not just for the kids, it's a whole family affair. So I hope you can all tune in um, for all those amazing resources that we have available. I do want to please just make sure that you follow us on all of our different social media channels. Uh, we always encourage you too, to throw up a little ha save tip, save, oh, excuse me, uh, throw up a uh, hashtag save the bay whenever you post any of those amazing actions that you all are doing every day um, that are helping to save the bay. So you can find us on the Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, or again, check out our website as well to find lots of great stuff. So since you came to this webinar, we hope that you'll kind of join us for our upcoming webinars. We have some really special stuff. Next week, uh, next Wednesday, we're actually gonna be joined by Dr. Fred C. Dobbs, who's gonna kind of give us a little deep dive into microplastics and how that's impacting our waterways. Um, and then early in early June, we'll be um, exploring um, fisheries. So again, make sure to check out that cbf.org slash webinars to kind of have all those places um, to link in and so save those dates for those upcoming webinars. So I did want to share and give a big thank you and a big virtual round of applause to our amazing expert um, educators. Again, Bill Portlock, our uh, senior educator, and Maya, our program manager at the Potomac River Environmental Education Program. Thank you all um, so much. Thank you again to Alice um, for all of your help um, keeping our ship on track today and keeping, the, keeping us timed and our, our questions coming in. So I do want to leave you all again with our last little um, moment of sin, of zen. <laughs> and what's really great about this photo is this actually was taken by Maya Alexander. So Maya, can you give us a little uh, summary of kind of about what's going on here? Yeah, so this is actually um, a picture of the bay um, from one of my favorite spots down at our Karen Noonan Center. All right, so we'll take a little moment. All right. Well, again, I'm Rick Mittler, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope to see you again for our next webinar.